Hello, this is Dr. Lori. Welcome to this discussion on evaluation of an association. An association is observing a relationship between two variables. So, for example, we may be thinking about smoking and lung cancer. We may be thinking about all kinds of different relationships. Um, an association does not necessarily mean causation. And in this video, I'll be looking at some of the other reasons that we might be seeing associations. Smoking and lung cancer is one of the associations that has been established to be um, a strong association and to be causal. And um, when we study the literature often, or if we even do our own studies, we often are looking at things that we're not sure about. At some point back in history, we were not sure about whether smoking and lung cancer were related to each other. And so I like to think about this as a process of evaluating different categories of reasons why we might see an association between two variables, such as smoking and lung cancer. And those four categories are random error, systematic error, real but not causal, and finally our our category that we're generally after, which is causal, um, but we don't want to jump to that automatically. So anytime you're reading a published journal article or if you're looking at your own research, always try to think about these different things. Now these are not nice, neat little cubby holes. Rather, it's a framework. Um, there's a lot of give and take between them, and I'll show you some places where people may even classify things a little bit differently than I've done here. But if you develop a way of thinking about these associations as you're either reading about them or studying them, then you'll have a really strong um, foundation for looking at things objectively. So first of all, I want to talk about random error. And with random error, this really has to do with chance. So anytime somebody says, well, could we have found that association by chance? The way we know about that is by looking at p-values. And by looking at p-value, what I mean by that is whenever we do hypothesis testing, when we state a null and alternate hypothesis, we come up with a t-value or a z-value and its associated p-value that goes with it. What we're really thinking about is, could I have found this association just by chance alone? What's the probability of getting that value of a z-value or more extreme? So. Um, the, the word error here means that I came up with the wrong conclusion. Error means I was wrong. And specifically with random error, that wrongness or that, that error can happen in either direction. And so it can be that I found that there was a strong positive or a strong negative association that really wasn't there. And so um, that error means that I picked up on something that isn't really there. So error is, is one way of saying I came to the wrong conclusion. With systematic error, on the other hand, I still came up with the wrong answer. Um, and so, so my conclusion is wrong. But it often is one directional. And so this systematic error or this bias pushes my results in one particular direction. So um, if you recall, uh, in previous um, assignments, a lot of times we've talked about we start with a population. And because it's too cumbersome or too expensive to study every single person, a lot of times we'll take a sample of individuals from that population and study them instead. So here I have my sample, my smaller subset of people, and what I do then is I take measurements. I measure their height and weight, I may ask them their age, I may measure their cholesterol, I take all kinds of measurements, and then based on what I find from those measurements, then I infer back to the population um, with that, with that hypothesis testing. So um, in this process um, of selecting a sample, I may have, I may 
I may bias um, the, the subset that I select. So for example, what if I only sampled people based on them having a telephone landline? In the old days, we would miss out on a few people. We would miss out on people who didn't have a home. Uh, maybe they were temporarily homeless or living with relatives. Um, Nowadays, if all I sampled was people with a landline, I might miss a larger segment of the population of people who don't have a landline, but they do have a cell phone. And so that would bias me to only sample a certain subset that may be different somehow by some factor than this overall population is, which is what I'm after. So be careful in that selection process. So that's my subject selection. Oftentimes that's called selection bias. Um, the other thing that can happen is that I can have some kind of a bias when I measure people. Um, if I ask people to tell me their age, they may forget and give me the wrong age. Um, they, if I ask people to tell me how tall they are or how much they weigh, um, there are certain subsets of the population that might um, sort of give give the wrong information either intentionally or um, unintentionally. And a lot of times that's called measurement bias or information bias. So the information that I have about each of my subjects could be biased. Um, a common example of this would be say a scale that weighs everybody um, 10 pounds too heavy. Um, or 10 pounds too light. So it, it gives me incorrect information. And because of that inc incorrect information, I may have this error, um, this bias. But notice that a lot of times systematic error is one directional, whereas random error could be either direction. Um, there's a third category. And this is something called real but not causal. A lot of textbooks don't talk about this category, but I like to think about it separately, and I'll tell you why. In um, error, everything here above the line, both 1 and 2, what I've collected is I, I, have, I have wrong things. I have error. In real but not causal, I have measured something that is real. It's, it's not a mistake. It's, it's actually present. If I measured it again and measured it correctly, um, I would measure that, that same exact thing. So there really is a real association. Remember, we're looking at associations here. I'm, I'm finding a real association, but it is not a cause and effect relationship. And there are two ways that this can happen very easily and often does in the published literature or your own findings. And one of them is called reversed cause and effect. A lot of times we have a preset idea of um, what um, exposures cause specific outcomes, but we need to be very careful about this reverse cause and effect. And it can be very subtle. Um, one really good example was a study on taking vitamins and um, different kinds of cancer. And so we're, we're interested in knowing if people take these foreign substances into their body, does it actually cause cancer to flourish? Um, the thing often that we forget is that when a person is diagnosed with cancer, they may actually change their behaviors. So during the time frame, two, five, ten years ago when the cancer was starting, maybe that person was not taking vitamins. But now, either immediately before the person was diagnosed and they're not really feeling all that well, so they start taking vitamins, um, but the cancer is there, it's just subclinical. Or even after they've been diagnosed, now they're like, okay, I'm going to do everything right. I'm going to take my vitamins. I'm going to be as healthy as I can. I'm going to, I'm going to beat this thing. And so we see a pretty strong association actually between cancer and taking vitamins. But it's usually the opposite of, of that. It's not the vitamins causing the cancer. In some cases it might be, but often it's that um, the cancer either knowing a person has cancer or just making a person not feel good prompts them enough to take vitamins. And so it's happened in reverse of what we thought we were studying. Confounding is an, another thing that can happen. And the classic example is carrying matches or carrying a cigarette lighter and the association between that and lung cancer. Now, um, it's kind of obvious if 
if you know that smoking causes lung cancer and people who are smokers would be more likely to carry either matches or a cigarette lighter um, we would say oh well you know that's that's super obvious that it's really not the cigarette lighter or this the matches in their pocket it's it's the smoking tobacco products that has caused the lung cancer but often we're studying things that are not that clear yet and so um, people have evaluated all kinds of interesting relationships. Another kind of humorous one that somebody put forward is in the world among women wearing um, nylon pantyhose is very strongly associated with cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. So we kind of look at that and we say well obviously women who are in higher income countries tend to be more likely to wear nylon pantyhose. Maybe they have a professional job, uh, maybe they are going to work, maybe they go to church, um, whatever, they get dressed up. Whereas women who live in low to middle income countries um, probably don't dress that same way and unfortunately often die of things other than um, heart disease probably earlier in their lives than would um, be their lifespan if they lived in a higher income country. And so that's just a confounded relationship. What we're really measuring when we measure the wearing nylons is we're measuring what, um, what country they live in. When we're measuring whether somebody is carrying matches or a a cigarette lighter in their pocket we're really measuring whether they're a smoker so it's it's a surrogate for that so with confounding it really muddles up that relationship um, if if we just had hundreds of non-smokers carry matches or a cigarette lighter in their pocket they wouldn't suddenly start having lung cancer from that um, or if we had women in low to middle income countries start wearing nylon pantyhose they wouldn't start having heart disease at a young age so those confounding there's a real relationship that's there but it is not causal um, so that's that's another category the fourth category is what we're really after in general when we are um, studying something and this is what we're what we're wondering about does smoking lead to an increased incidence of lung cancer and the answer is yes um, if we can rule out um, one two and three then we can get to this fourth category and say yeah well that probably is then something that's causal under causal there are um, a variety of different things that um, could be causing that um, direct things happen within the physiology of the body so um, smoking a cigarette um, causes changes in the lungs it leads to deposits and mutations and that kind of thing so it directly happens all inside of the body indirect causal um, associations um, often are external maybe they're related to socioeconomic status or access to health care um, and the one of the interesting things to think about with causal is if you have X and we say that leads to Y if we were to take this relationship away if we were to take away the X and, and get rid of it then Y also disappears. And so if we were to remove um, the, the barriers to access to care and, and a person started getting the care that they needed it that was quality care, then um, and, and that negative outcome goes away, that poor health outcome, then we call that causal because we've taken away the cause and therefore the outcome also um, goes away. So that's one way of thinking about causal relationships. Um, if we took away if we took away the um, the cigarettes, the cigarette smoking, we see the the incidence of lung cancer go down um, over time, lung cancer, cardiovascular disease, and all those kinds of things. So um, that's an overview of evaluating a positive association. It's also very important to remember that sometimes these things are all happening at the same time. We might have 
some random error. We might have a little bit of systematic error. We might have a teensy bit of real but not causal, maybe some confounders added to that particular effect. Our goal really is to minimize the effects of these other um, possible reasons that we're seeing in association so that we can see what's left over, what's the causal part that that is really there. We could, for example, have um, evaluate an association that's not there. Maybe systematic error biased it in the opposite direction so that a relationship that really is present gets covered up. Or maybe we have um, different kinds of bias biasing that relationship in both directions. And so we really don't know how much is it going because of the measurement or the information or the selection bias or the random error or confounding. What we're trying to do then is to minimize the random error, the systematic error, the real but not causal effects so that we can see what's causal. Ultimately, our goal is to be able to have some kind of an intervention that will take care of that exposure so that we can improve the health of the population, we can improve the outcomes. So as you're reading through the literature, as you're um, doing your own research, um, pay attention to those other reasons that we might see in association so that you're not um, tricked into thinking that something is there that's not. Um, and you can also um, you can design your studies so that they will avoid those kinds of mistakes. Thank you for joining me.